Hello everyone, and thanks for watching. Today's video is going to be a general overview of social psychology. I must admit that social psychology is actually one of my favorite topics to teach. The reason is that it covers a lot of territory. After all, the American Psychological Association, or APA, defines social psychology as being interested in all aspects of personality and social interaction, exploring the influence of interpersonal and group relationships on human behavior. This means that social psychology has a role to play in far-reaching topics like education, family dynamics, the workplace, your neighborhood, communities, and the wider society in which you live. I like to describe it as covering everything from who you date to why people hate. Some people get confused between social psychology and sociology. I'm sure I'm going to have some people disagree with this, but generally speaking, social psychology has more of an individualistic view with the focus being on how people individually interact with others. Sociology looks more at group dynamics rather than individual views. However, I do have to say that the line isn't always clearly drawn, and I have certainly known of some sociologists that gravitate more towards the individual level and some social psychologists that have focused on group dynamics. As with many of my general overview videos, the point of this video is to cover some of the larger topics within social psychology, and then briefly discuss individual topics. If you want to expand your learning of individual topics, definitely check out some of the micro-learning videos that I did on those, and you can check out the links for them below. Many fields in psychology have philosophical or perceptual debates that influence how individual psychologists view the larger topic in which they're studying. Think of something like the argument between nature versus nurture that we talked about way back at the start of this video series, or the difference between continuous and discontinuous growth that we talked about in developmental psychology. Well, social psychology has two such disagreements or debates. The first is the difference between focusing on intrapersonal versus interpersonal topics. Intrapersonal topics deal with the individual themselves, and covers things like emotions, perspectives, and what we generally call social cognition. Social cognition covers what we think of ourselves and others. Interpersonal topics deal more with how the individual views other people. The second philosophical disagreement goes more into how a person interacts with their surroundings, including the people around them, and the level of influence they exert on us. This is the difference between situational and dispositional influences. The situational perspective believes that our actions, behaviors, thoughts, and beliefs are influenced by the situations we happen to find ourselves in. So if you held this belief as a social psychologist, you may explore things like how people may get swept up into a riot or a mob mentality, or otherwise do things out of character for them because they got caught up in the moment. The dispositional perspective refutes this and puts more emphasis on how the person's own internal motives, emotions, and beliefs shape their behaviors. This is definitely one of those areas in psychology where there is no right or wrong perspective. They're just differing views. Also, don't think of these as being perspectives that someone has 100% of the time. Some social psychologists may gravitate more towards the interpersonal or dispositional, but still see the merit in the intrapersonal or the situational. Please also remember that because we're talking about social psychology, this isn't a situation where one size fits all. Depending on your cultural background, your perspectives and influences may change wildly. A good example of how culture can have an overarching impact on social psychology is the difference between individualistic and collectivist cultures. A collectivist culture is one where there is more emphasis placed on a person working as part of a group and de-emphasizes personal autonomy. These tend to be very common in Asia and typically the group is a person's family. You can see this tendency in many practices that are common throughout South and East Asia. For example, to this day in many parts of India and elsewhere, arranged marriages are still very much so the norm. The idea is that a person getting married isn't just about you finding a partner, it's about you expanding the family. 
So their view is that this is a decision for the family to make. Individualistic cultures are the opposite. These are societies that place a large amount of importance on individual freedom and independence. Generally speaking, these tend to be very common in the West, and many people have reported that the culture of many predominantly English-speaking countries are prime examples of really strong individualistic societies. This would include countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Ireland, among others. Individualistic influences aren't better or worse than collectivist influences. They're just different. There are definitely pros and cons to both types of cultures. However, one particularly common pitfall to living in an individualistic society is something called the fundamental attribution error. To tie in the terms we already talked about in this video, the fundamental attribution error is the tendency for a person to overemphasize dispositional factors in explaining someone's behavior and de-emphasize the power of the situation. Let me give you an example of this in action. My wife and I love to go to trivia nights. We tend to do pretty well on them and find it to be a fun way to just meet other people and get out of the house. For a long time, we would go to a local brewery that always had a very large trivia night and the same person would always do the MC. One night, we started talking to another team and they mentioned how much they liked the MC, whose name was Josh, by the way. They kept talking about how smart Josh was because he was able to explain all of the answers. This is a great example of the fundamental attribution error. Now, we don't know Josh, and I'm sure he is a pretty smart guy. However, if you're in seeing a trivia night, you definitely know the answers in advance. In fact, he picked the questions himself, and I'm sure he reviewed the information beforehand so that he knew how to explain the answers if somebody happens to challenge the question. So why would you assume that he was intelligent, especially when he had the ability to pick the questions and review the answers well in advance? This was highlighted in a study done in 1977 called the Quizmaster Study. Researchers took participants and divided them into two groups. One group was to come up with questions to ask the other group. The questions could be about anything that people wanted. They just had to know the answer and they had to be fairly difficult questions. Afterwards, the group that was being asked the questions were interviewed, and a large percentage said they believed the people asking the questions had a higher intelligence than they did. Again, the questioners were able to ask any difficult question they wanted to and can pick from any topic. I mean, think about it for a second. I kind of think that anybody is an expert in something. So why would we assume the person asking the question is smarter, which is a dispositional factor, when it was clearly the situation that benefited them. Again, this tendency of the fundamental attribution error is much more common in individualistic societies. What's interesting though, is that this tendency to overemphasize dispositional factors in other people isn't universal in how it's applied. What I mean is that we usually have dispositional judgments about other people and their behaviors, but when we're talking about our own actions, we're more likely to attribute them to situational factors. This is called actor-observer bias, and it's really pretty common. Let me give you some examples. Say you're stuck in traffic and somebody cuts you off. Now, let's be really honest here. What's the first thing you start to think about in a situation like this? I'm sure if you're like most people, you have all sorts of curse words going through your mind, maybe out your mouth, and you're probably flooded with thoughts about how incredibly stupid the other driver must be, how reckless they are, how they're incompetent. These are all dispositional factors. However, if we start being even more honest, chances are that at some point in your life, you've cut somebody off in traffic too. Did all those things I just mentioned also apply to you? Did you think to yourself, oh yeah, I cut somebody off because I'm stupid, I'm reckless, I'm incompetent. Probably not. Most of us would explain that action as being a mistake. Maybe you just didn't see the other car and they shouldn't be freaking out over an honest mistake. How about you go to a store and the cashier is rude to you? Maybe you start thinking about what a mean, nasty person they are. But do you ever think maybe the person is just having a bad day and you shouldn't take it personally? Some of us do, but I can tell you in an individualistic society, it is far more likely that we're going to make that dispositional judgment of them. 
Many people get the fundamental attribution error confused with the actor-observer bias. A good way to remember the difference is that fundamental attribution error is how you view other people, whereas actor-observer bias is reciprocal. It's about how you view other people and how you view yourself. Part of what propels the actor-observer bias is a tendency we have for another bias, which is called the self-serving bias. The self-serving bias simply describes that we tend to do things, including thinking and judging, based on what is in our own personal self-interest. If I make a mistake, like cutting someone off in traffic, it makes me feel better to know that this isn't because I'm a bad person, it was just a mistake brought about from the situation. This way, it isn't a blow to my ego. Another example of how our Western over-reliance on dispositional traits influences social thinking is something called the Just World Hypothesis. The Just World Hypothesis is the belief that people largely get the outcomes in life that they deserve. This is a great example in psychology of there being a difference between what we tend to believe to be true versus what we logically know to be correct. What I mean is that most of us know logically that in life, bad things can absolutely happen to good people. Maybe even more infuriating is that good things sometimes happen to really bad people. Someone getting cancer or getting involved in a car accident isn't necessarily a judgment on how that person has lived their life. Despite us logically knowing these things to be true, feelings aren't facts. The view of many people on homeless individuals is a great example of this. Often we hear people make judgments about dispositional failures on their part as being responsible for their homelessness. Maybe it's someone saying that they're alcoholics or drug addicts. Maybe they prefer to be homeless and are being manipulative when asking other people for money. Or they're homeless because they're just lazy and don't want to work. I can tell you firsthand that many people who end up homeless are not drug addicts not alcoholics, and definitely do not want to be homeless. Even the ones that do use alcohol and drugs are often doing it as a way of just trying to make themselves feel better about their situation. Many times it seems that we hold on to this view of a just world because it makes us feel safer and more secure in a world that we know is chaotic and scary at times. After all, if I'm worried about being homeless because of financial reasons, it makes me feel better to know that I'm a good person and that just wouldn't happen to me because I'm good and I don't deserve it. Bad things only happen to bad people or people that did something wrong to deserve it. Like I said earlier, this is a great example of a topic in psychology that we know isn't true but still tend to believe. I've been teaching about this stuff for years now and definitely know better, yet I have to remind myself about it from time to time too. Just the other day, I was having a really bad day and I just had a million things on my plate that needed to be done. I was stressed out and it was one of those days where I was just getting angrier by the minute. I taught a class and as I was leaving school that day, I walked out to the parking lot to get into my truck to drive home. As I was doing this, I noticed that the rear tire of my truck was completely flat. And immediately I had this reaction of, why God, why me? I'm a good person, I don't deserve this. Of course, the tire going flat wasn't a judgment on how I was living my life. It's just some random thing that happened to occur at a really bad time. But again, it goes to show how strong that type of thinking can be. Situations like this one and others I've mentioned in this video so far always remind me of the way in which the events that happen throughout our lives shape us psychologically and then how psychological factors can influence our perspectives of other life events. This is a very reciprocal relationship and ties into a lot of other topics in social psychology. In many ways, this goes back to something we've talked about a few times before in these videos. Remember when we talked about the prototype model in cognitive psychology, and then again when we talked about it in Piaget's theory of cognitive development? Those are below, and I suggest you review them if you don't remember them, because it actually comes up again when we talk about social psychology. The prototype model explains how we make sense of the world around us by organizing information, experiences, and just our overall understanding of how the world works into categories of information, which are called schemas. Well, we can apply this to explain how we believe we should act based upon the situation we find ourselves in, 
the type of role we take on, and even to help us better understand the way people should behave in a society. We call these social scripts, social roles, and social norms. A social script is a schema of how a person should behave in a specific setting. So for example, how people tend to form a single line facing a cashier when waiting to check out at a store. Social scripts are rules that apply to everyone, but are very specific to a certain setting. Social roles are patterns of behaviors expected of someone filling a specific role. We've referred to them as being role schemas in past videos. The role can be a profession, a group membership, subgroup, affiliation, or even a role within a family. Social norms are broader and more universally applied. These are customs, behaviors, and social rules that govern how everyone should act in a society. They are not as specific as social scripts. For example, not picking your nose is something that you shouldn't do in general, but especially anywhere in public. Social norms also apply regardless of social roles. They apply to everybody. What's interesting is that all these types of schemas are created through our lives and reinforced often through nonverbal ways. What tends to underlie all of them is an inherent need that many of us have to be liked by other people and to feel a sense of belonging. Sometimes this pressure can lead us to experience persuasion that can influence our behaviors. Frequently, this pressure helps propel us to change our behaviors in order to conform to the way other people are behaving and to conform to the expectations that others have of us. It's important to note that in social psychology, when we start talking about topics like persuasion, obedience, and group identity, we tend to view these in a very negative way. While it's true that social influences can at times exert detrimental effects on our behavior, the vast majority of the time, they're completely beneficial. There just seems to be a tendency that most people have to pay more attention to the bad over the good. This is even reinforced by many of the studies that have been done in social psychology. In fact, one of the reasons why I like social psychology so much is because there are a ton of really cool experiments that have been done in the field. Some of these experiments can tend to give a negative impression of many of the topics in social psychology though. So as I go through many specific topics in my micro learning videos on social pressure, social bias, and persuasion, I'll be sure to not just talk about the bad, but also to share some of the good aspects to these topics and to the experiments that I'll be discussing. In fact, I'll also even do a separate video on what we call pro-social behaviors. These are behaviors that encourage actions that help deepen and expand social interactions and foster healthy relationships between people. The links to all those micro learning videos can be found below. If you're enjoying the content I'm presenting in these videos, please make sure that you like the individual videos and also subscribe to my YouTube channel. By doing this, you show your support and also help me to expand this channel into other topics designed to help college students do better in school. This means that I can do other videos on topics like anatomy and physiology, biology, growth and development, and many other subjects. Thanks for watching everybody and have a great day. Thank you.